David Foster Wallace was a massive fan of the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. And Wallace not only was inspired by Wittgenstein in his philosophical and mathematical career, but also took Wittgenstein's philosophy and made it the axiomatic core of his first novel, The Broom of the System. And in today's video, we are going to hear Wallace talk at length on Wittgenstein. And for all of you guys out there who haven't sifted through the philosophical and investigations or the Tractatus yet. I'm here to help give you shortcuts to understand the integration of Wallace and Wittgenstein's philosophy. So without any further ado, let us hear from Wallace. Well, there's a kind of tragic fall Wittgenstein's obsessed with all the way from the Tractatus in 1922 to the philosophical investigations in his last years. I mean, a real book of Genesis type tragic fall. The loss of the whole external world, the Tractatus's picture theory of meaning presumes that the only possible relation between language and the world is denotative, referential. In order for language both to be meaningful and to have some connection to reality, words like tree and house have to be little pictures, representations of real trees and houses, mimesis, but nothing more, which means we can know and speak of nothing more than little mimetic pictures, which divide us metaphysically and forever from the external world, if you buy such a metaphysical schism, you are left with only two options. One is that the individual person with their language is trapped in here, with the world out there, and never the twain shall meet. Which even if you think language's pictures really are mimetic, is an awful lonely proposition. And there's no iron guarantee the pictures truly are mimetic, which means you are looking at solipsism. One of the things that makes Wittgenstein a real artist to me is that he realized that no conclusion could be more horrible than solipsism. And so he trashed everything he'd been lauded for in the Tractatus and wrote the Investigations, which is the single most comprehensive and beautiful argument against solipsism that's ever been made. Wittgenstein argues that for language even to be possible, it must always be a function of relationships between persons. That's why he spends so much time arguing against the possibility of a private language. So he makes language dependent on human community. But unfortunately, we are still stuck with the idea that there is this world of reference out there because we can never really join or know because we are stuck in here, in language, even if we are at least all in here together. Oh yeah, the other original option. The other option is to expand the linguistic subject, expand the self. This was Wittgenstein's double bind. You can either treat language as an infinite, infinitely small, dense dot, or you let it become the world, the exterior and everything in it. The former banishes you from the garden, the latter seems more promising. If the world is itself a linguistic construct, there's nothing outside language for language to have to picture or refer to. This lets you avoid solipsism, but it leads right to the postmodern, post-structural dilemma of having to deny yourself an existent independent of language. Heidegger's the guy most people think got us into this bind, but when I was working on Broom of the System, I saw Wittgenstein as the real architect of the postmodern trap. He died right on the edge of explicitly treating reality as linguistic instead of onto, ontological. This eliminated solipsism, but not the whore, because we are still stuck. The investigation's line that is that the fundamental problem of language is, quote, I don't know my way about, end quote. If I were separate from language, if I could somehow detach from it and climb up and look down on it, get the lay of the land, so to speak, I could study it objectively, take it apart, deconstruct it know its operations and boundaries and deficiencies. But that's not how things are. I'm in it. We're in language. Wittgenstein's not Heidegger. It's not that language is us, but we are still in it, inescapably, the same way we are in like Kant's space-time. Wittgenstein's conclusions seem completely sound to me, always have. And if there's one thing that consistently bugs me writing-wise, it's that I don't feel I really do know my way around inside language. I never seem to get that the kind of clarity and concision I want. All right, I know that is a ton to unpack, so we're gonna take it kind of slide by slide, and I'll be adding in things, um, obviously, for context and connecting it to Wallace's work. So, first of all, one of the words that kind of gets used a couple times is mimesis and mimetic, and that really just means mimic mimicry. It's a it's really just a representation of something, a simulacrum of something, a copy of a copy, and that's the first postulation that Wallace starts to make that. Language in and of itself is mimetic because when we look or when I say the word book, you create a picture in your mind that really maybe isn't the book that I am currently looking at. But the problem with this is that in this mimetic trap, all we are saying and thinking is just this sea of representational forms and language is just functioning 
as a function and really nothing more. It's not this magical thing. It's just um, a vehicle to create these representational pictures. But this is where Wallace talks about the fall. So the fall that happens is that if that's what our reality is, if we're stuck with only being able to use language for these mimetic representations, then we are forever split from the external world. We'll never be able to actually understand it and be able to connect with it. That's kind of leading us into solipsism. And this is where Wittgenstein, you know, creates this specter of solipsism that still infects a lot of our brain today. Because when we start to think about language and copies of copies and today where um, digital technology and so many other things are prevalent. It's e even easier. And people who aren't even engaged with language and have been trained almost to be solipsistic from day one, which I think is what a lot of modern culture is just embedding in, in us, just solipsism in general. And to get even crazy here, the problem with this kind of mimetic theory of language is that there, as Wallace says, there is no guarantee that the pictures that we have in our head and, you know, think of something that you know really well, what your wife's face looks like or um, what the tile or carpet on your floor looks like. Okay, so if you're seeing that, Wallace says that there's no guarantee that that's actually an accurate representation of reality. What if these mimetic pictures and this mimetic sea of cohesion that we're creating all the time isn't actually real because there's no way to act, there's no way to actually prove it. And it's really talking about the essence of things because when I say book, am I really capturing the essence of this? And that's a whole other discussion, but there's obviously room for it to be, no, you're not capturing that. So it's really all just really useless. And then once again, we're writing on, writing on into solipsism because we want to be able to, with our mimetic propositions, with our language, be able to connect other people because there's got to be a community. Solipsism is, it's only my individual subjective perspective of reality. And so with language is supposed to be able to connect us and we're supposed to find some form of unity between us through language. And if that's not possible, this thing that really separates us from the animals and connects us, if that's not functioning, then it's a really scary world. And v Wittgenstein didn't like this reality. He didn't like where this philosophy was heading because once you understand the depth and loneliness of solipsism and, and what it creates, the worst people in the world, honestly, the psychopaths, the self-preservers, the people who, you know, help create such an immense amount of death, 268 million people dying from democide, innocent pe people dying at the hands of government in the 20th century alone. A lot of those people were solipsistic. Most people in the world, and this is really crazy, are solipsistic. You ask them what they care about, their experience, and then you even better look at how they live their life. We are living in a world of people who uh, whose whole function is self-preservation at a high level and because there's always someone like self-preservation is the human biological function that's not wrong it's like yes it actually is because if you can actually go up the 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 and rise up out of base consciousness you don't have to be in self-preservation mode all the time it's not hard and because of the rise of narcissism and uh, the sibling society, a lot of people out there are actually just Satanists, fun you know, fronting as you know, uh, Christians or empathetic people. But when you look at their core philosophy, and I don't believe in Christianity or Satan, but they have an adversarial energy. They want to destroy and not build because they feel like they're the whole center of the of the universe revolves around them. And when you have a capitalistic system that isn't based in it really any system, um, any any system system, uh, political system could work if the population was charitable and very educated, or at least the top 10 or 20% of society was charitable and educated and empathetic and ready to lead. Uh, it, that, it, anyway, we, we won't get too lost in the weeds on politics right now, but Wittgenstein was horrified by this. And as I've talked about on the program before, Wittgenstein really was interested, even though a lot of his stuff is somewhat abstract and seems, seems somewhat dry. When we look at it, <laughs> We look at his personal life. I shouldn't say this because I said this in my last video and there was a guy who commented like 30 different things. Uh, he was like, in eight, in 1923, Wittgenstein slapped the back of his people's head. And like, I didn't know any of this, but there's like all these uh, abusive allegations that Wittgenstein was uh, beating up his students for being dumb. But you know, a little corporal punishment every once in a while back in the day. Maybe that wasn't the worst thing. 
Anyway, but Wittgenstein was somewhat more interested in ethics and the soul than you think he would he would be if you just read his two big philosophical works. And one could also say that our job as artists is the rejection of solipsism. That by being able to make people feel and make empathetic connections and see through different perspectives and all that stuff, we are actively fighting against this push into pure subjectivism, into moral relativism on steroids. And Walt says something controversial here, but I don't I wouldn't view it as controversial. I felt the same way that the Choctatus is revered still by a lot of people as Wittgenstein's best work, that they see his philosophical investigations as somewhat of a meandering away and trying and like a much lesser work and not really that original and walking back a lot of the stuff that he was doing before. And it, coincidentally, a lot of the people who have told me that, uh, and you can, you can tell by how people write, like yeah, I've read thousands of five, six, 7,000 comments at this point and been a part of message boards and discords for my entire life, basically, that the type of people who say that, I could just feel them like being kind of smelly and like engineering and like they talk to women like they're straight. Ah, that's not right. No. <laughs> they're the person that say, t tell me it's not Tractatus, it's Tractatus or Tractatus or some other crazy pronunciation. I lived in Austria. Anyway, so in the investigations, uh, Wittgenstein moves away from this idea that language is just a function of uh, mimetic representation and starts to postulate that language is serving as a vehicle of soci uh, sociality, of its inherent language is inherently linked to community and human relationships. And this is a critique of the private language. And this is like such a big part of of linguistics. I, I've taken multiple in, you know, my eight years in, in school, in university, I've taken, I took so many, I, not so many, I took three or four linguistic classes and every single time they were like these crazy descriptivist professors who didn't believe in grammar and language. I remember my freshman year, we had this crazy professor and he, he didn't believe in grammar and language at all. And he'd go on these crazy rants, just be going off. And this was in Utah, and, like, the whole class was Mormon. The whole class was, I felt like, guys that just got back from their mission and girls who were, like, women who were getting ready to be housewives. And they were just shot. I was shot. But during the semester, I suffered, like, two really bad concussions from extreme sports. And so I was donezo. So I was, like, just, I was loving it every single day. And But I wasn't, like, absorbing too much. I was just getting, like, the vibes and writing writing copious notes and stuff but we would have these tests where he would quiz us on everything he said like and he'd be talking about these super esoteric concepts and then would be quizzing us on it and all these kids were so mad because they were just trying to get uh elective credit or something and move on with their life and go be an engineer or just like you know go be normies and this guy's like pushing the limit and people are failing and stuff and i did a test and i didn't do very good so there's, there's there was this one girl with the most serious energy like as Mormon as you can be, but she was in it. She was listening. And so this guy would give us tests and then just walk out of the room and say, last person, uh, last person taking it, just come slide, slide all the tests under my door. So I waited until everyone was gone. And I, um, you know, went into the pile, found her paper, you know, copied, copied her answers. You know, I'll admit it here. I cheated everybody. I cheated. And then the next class after he had graded it all, or a couple of classes later, one of the guys was so mad. He was, this, you know, he's like the leader, you know, just got back from his mission. He's like, I don't understand anything that's going on. Who in the he he didn't say hell, obviously. Who in the heck in this class is even good at this stuff? Who's even understanding this grammar and this private, we, he loved the private language stuff. And he looks at us and he says, Ian understands. Hey guys, I used to show up with these crazy headbands and I would make these custom shirts that were like super anti-religion and anti-war. I would have shirts that said like Joseph Smith had a 14 year old wife and wear them and come to this class because it was at 7 a.m. Sometimes I would just be partying all night and just show up at this class and everybody knew I was partying and they were all super judgy. So when he said that, the guy got so red in the face and everyone looked at me like everyone was like, what the hell is going on? Heck is going on. And I just kept the troll going. I was like, thank you, professor. You've really expanded my linguistical ideas of reality and why grammar doesn't exist. And he was like, yes, yes, yes. Anyway, so Wittgenstein talks about this private language. 
that only one person can use. And Wittgenstein says that this type of language is not possible because the meaning and use of words is established through a community of speakers, that we have this community of people and they are what establishes meaning. And we see this with the kind of changing nature of words. And this is kind of the divide between prescriptivism and descriptivism. When we look at something like I always advocate on the show for, and if you are still listening, I have a PDF you guys can get down below with over a hundred of David Foster Wallace's favorite books, books that he has mentioned that he has been influenced by, like the most important works for him. And one of those, which he always had with the while he was writing, was Garner's Modern American Usage. And in this, it talks about the evolving language and evolving words and ideas. And it's not just like slang words, but it's, for instance, how the word neither has evolved in 2024. How the how we use neither is different today than it was 30 years ago. And it kind of keeps you up to date on all this because there is this kind of community aspect to how words are used. And this is much more feel good, right? Like when you hear this, you're like, oh, yeah. That makes us feel good. But Wallace, once again, kind of throws us into this conundrum, though, that we can never actually prove this. Because he says uh, th this world of reference out there that we can never really join or know because we are stuck in here, in language, even if we are at least all in, he all in here together. So we've escaped solecism, but we are now stuck in language with each other, which maybe isn't, well, it's better, but it's still somewhat confusing. And so Wallace earlier mentioned that there are two options, right? So we've kind of talked about the initial option, which is expanding the linguistic subject, which is where we expand ourselves so much that we embody the entire world. This is where everything becomes linguistical. The world, reality, space. This is like a writer's dream. Like, praise the Lord, you know, praise David Foster Wallace and Wittgenstein. If we just make everything linguistical, they, there needs to be no distinction between language and the world because before we were stuck in language, right? We were uh, in this community and we we're in language, right? But then there's still this outside world. But if we expand language to the world, then there's nothing outside. There is no divide. It's all one now. And there's nothing that needs to be represented because we have our – so if we have our community of people and we come up with you know a great uh, meaning for the word book and Brian Garner agrees with us, well, there's – we're still mimicking with language, with the word book, with the referent, um, a book, which is outside of us, which is still binds us from the garden, which, you know, and everything. So why not just include it? Why not just move out into everything, which is honestly very problematic and very genius all at the same time. Because language, like when you get into Eastern philosophy and meditation, it's it's somewhat useless. Like there are certain things like the om, om root chakra sil syllable and like certain other things and uh, that are important and language, obviously you need it, but getting too deep into the weeds and making language everything like that could be some, that kind of seems like a David Foster Wallace theory. I remember in Infinite Jest, Wallace says that uh, all addicts have, 99% of addicts have an overthinking problem and obviously Wallace has a deep overthinking problem. So like this is, that's the best way for overthinkers to overthink is everything's now language. And this is where we now kind of move into Derrida. This is where we, the postmodernism and post-structuralism and all that start to manifest. And I'm actually going to have some great videos on this soon. I made some great uh, charts back in the day I just found talking about uh, Derrida's view of language and the, the abyss and all that. We'll get into that later. But the problem with this and what's kind of the postmodernists figured out, first of all, is like the idea of meaning that, okay, what what is what is language even mean? What is There's this abyss now between us and real autonomy because now everything is language, you know, everything is language. But are we not autonomous outside of language? Are we not free now? Now there's a divide between language and actual reality. You know, it's kind of just this endless trap. Now I kind of want to take us back to the quote. We, we only have like one slide left and I want to kind of reread it because now that we have, you guys have the fundamentals down, the ending will kind of make more sense and then we can explicate on this because you guys have probably forgot a lot of this. So let's start with Heidegger. Heidegger is the guy that most people think got us into this bind. But when I was working on Broom of the System, uh, and the bind is independence of language I was just talking about, I saw Wittgenstein as the real architect of the postmodernist modern, modern trap. He died right on the edge of explicitly treating reality as linguistic instead of ont ontological. This eliminated solipsism, but not the whore, because we are still stuck. 
The investigations line that is fundamental, the fundamental problem of language is, quote, I don't know my way about. If we were, if I were separate from language, if I could somehow detach from it and climb up and look down on it, get the lay of the land, so to speak, I could study it objectively, take it apart, deconstruct it, know its operations and boundaries and deficiencies. But that's not how things are. I'm in it. We are in language. Wittgenstein's not Heidegger. It's not that language is us, but we are still in it, inescapably, the same way we are in Kant's space-time. Wittgenstein's conclusions seem completely sound to me, always have. If there's one thing that consistently bugs me writing-wise, it's I don't feel I really do know my way around inside language. I never seem to get the kind of clarity and concision I want. And this is what's crazy because Wallace brings up Kant and a lot of us don't realize that, well, no one realizes that a lot of our ideas and frameworks of reality uh, stem from Kant, stem you know, from a lot of these people. And once an idea comes about, you don't have to know about Kant's theory of space and time or Wittgenstein or postmodernism for it to be true or for it to be functioning in reality. Just because Joe Schmo redneck at the store has no idea about what's going on doesn't mean that things aren't true and things aren't still happening around him. You don't have to believe for something still to be functioning in reality. This is what I feel like a lot of people don't get about politics is that the people at the top of politics are so power hungry and depraved and stuff that our con we can't comprehend like how bad it actually is. And most people don't believe that at all. Most people are just like, you know, they're corrupt and stuff, but they don't realize how deep that corruption goes. They don't realize um, when we look at people like Jeffrey Epstein and all that, that we're just starting to uh, crack open the door about what's going on. And it's always been that way. When we look back at history and the corruption and the exploitation of by people in power all throughout history, it was terrible. And we can only assume that it just has gotten worse, just like everything else. Things get bigger and crazier as the world continues to expand. It's this weird form of entropy. But we don't need to believe in that for those people to still function and still do their thing and exploit other people, whether it is weird stuff or just the exploitation of populations um, for profit or whatever. And I once again think that this is a lot of the stuff that we just read about Wallace really sounds like he feels stuck. And you could do two things with this. Like I was saying about belief, once you know, you know. Now you guys know. If you don't know about this, now you know. Maybe you could think of your, think your way out of it and then you'll be free. But constraints have never necessarily been a bad thing. Wallace views it as being stuck. I view it as the most overwhelmingly positive view of reality I've ever heard, which may sound insane, but think of it this way. We have the power of language. Language is everything, right? We have this immense power and we can use language in the medium of art and communication to change the world and connect with people and actually feel connected to others through language. Um, and you, you guys feel this. You feel this with me right now or with your wife or with your friends. It's beautiful. And so we can capture that. And then there's this wild west. There's this weird zone out there outside of language, this autonomous reality that we may not be able to know. But through spirituality, through meditation and contemplation in nature and silence and getting off technology, you can start to touch it. Will you fully understand it? No. That's been religion forever. You'll never really be able to understand God. You can get glimpses. You can have these ecstatic moments. I remember someone left a comment the other day talking about Leo Tolstoy, how he he said that he only had seven or 10 ecstatic moments in his life and he wished that they went on forever, but that was what he was most thankful for. And I agree that I look back and there are these moments of ecstasy that I was given, given where, where I felt like I was touching God or touching nature, the primordial force of the universe. And I did do feel connected. I do have faith that that something is is real and I can connect with it. And if you haven't connected with it, then you don't know. And this all sounds crazy, but that that's the that's religion. This kind of personal journey toward experiencing deeper levels of of this autonomous reality. And I think Wallace's overthinking and who he was in general kind of prevented him a lot of the time from getting there. And when you read Infinite Jest and look at his own personal life, he that that was his main struggle because to join AA, you have to, first of all, realize and admit that you're not that smart. You're an idiot. You got addicted to something. You're an alcoholic. Like you're not better than anybody else. You're you know, and Wallace always postulates that everyone thinks like one of the main uh, big secret that everyone has is that we all think we're different. You know, Ian at Right Conscious, you know, I'm way different than all of you guys. And you think so, too. All those guys at work, all those self-preservers I was talking crap about earlier at the grocery store, we're better. than You know, but we're really not. I still make mistakes all the time. I still get into self-preservation mode or just do absolutely dumb things. And so I'm the exact same as them. And you have to give up this idea of your own godliness, of your own 
power in the linguistic realm because you can use the linguistic realm for anything um, because that that includes math and uh, power acquisition. You can get everything. But to look outside of that, to touch God or touch, you know, energy, you have to be humble. It's not a crazy experience. It's one of humbleness and silence and uh, grace. You don't, that's why you don't see any religious prophets or figures or um, apostles or whatever acting like little little Uzi Vert, you know? And there's, there's a reason, even today, in all traditions all around the world, you don't see that. Even the most pagan religions that were crazy and sacrificing people, there was still a sense of a system and of, of trying to be reverent toward, you know, something else. And I guess maybe that's how we escape solacism. We enter into this linguistical stuckness and the next level out that is exploring the wilderness which we'll never be able to finish and uh, wallace i think really got caught up on that he couldn't understand language he was gonna he thought that he could do it he thought through his maximalism and his study and all this stuff that he could control language and get like he was saying a fifty thousand feet view above of language and view it objectively and understand what we're doing here in this little stuck trap But you can't do that. The only thing that you're able to do is get a glimpse of it, understand you're here, and then go on to the important part, which is moving outside of yourself, whether that be through charity or through the exploration of spirituality. So thank you guys for being here. Leave any thoughts or comments down below. And you guys already know that we are going to be diving deeper into David Foster Wallace every single day.